the next award, um, the, the next speaker. So we will now have um, the winner of the Marjorie Sweeting Dissertation Prize, which is a national award for the best undergraduate dissertation undertaken in a UK university uh, in the field of geomorphology. And the nomination deadline for this is the September is September the 30th. So I believe that if you would like to nominate someone, um, you're still able to do that for this year. Um, the 2020 Marjorie Sweeting Prize is awarded to Aaron Wild, um, who was supervised by Professor Ed Rhodes at the University of Sheffield. Aaron's undergraduate dissertation was titled The Hypsometry of Glaciated Mountain Ranges with Varying Uplift and Erosion Rates and Its Influence on Their Geomorphic Evolution. Aaron's work has examined complex topographic distributions of glaciated mountain ranges across a number of exciting locations, um, which I hope you'll enjoy hearing about. The panel um, felt that Aaron's work was to be highly commended for its very high quality, as well as an impressive degree of insight into the geomorphic expression of complex glacial processes. I think that's praise that any of us would like to receive. Um, and you can hear a podcast um, by Aaron and based on his work made by the Royal Geographical Society. And I'll put a link to that in the chat. Um, Aaron is planning and hoping to carry on uh, doing glacial research as a PhD student in the near future. So a what better advert for his work than giving this talk and um, receiving this prize for his dissertation. So I'll pass. Hi everyone, my name is Aaron Wilde and I'm a Glaciology Master's student at the University of Sheffield and I'm honoured to have been named this year's uh, winner of the Marjorie Sweeting Award. Um, I'd like to welcome you to my presentation, um, which is on work I carried out for my undergraduate dissertation at the University of Sheffield under the supervision of uh, Professor Ed Rhodes and Dr Daryl Swift, um, for which I was awarded this prize. Um, this work is looking at the hypsometry of glaciated uh, mountain ranges um, with varying uplift and erosion rates and the implications for their geomorphic evolution. So hypsometry is the distribution of topography in a basinal region um, and we can infer the tectonic and uh, erosional processes that are operational in that region by analysing uh, the hypsometry. Um, we can analyse a region's hypsometry by looking at its hypsometric curve and uh, hypsometric integral. Um, and these both enable the visualisation and quantification of a region's hypsometry. So the hypsometric curve um, relates uh, proportional surface area um, to elevation. Um, and that is uh, such as the ones in figure one, which are on screen here. And they are idealised uh, hypsometric curves of the same region. Um, so we can display uh, these curves um, in two different ways. The first is non-cumulative, which is shown in panel A, um, and that shows the absolute proportional uh, surface area that lies within a certain elevation bin. And the second is uh, cumulatively, which is shown in panel B, um, and this essentially uh, accumulates the proportional surface area within the region. Uh, finally, the hypsometric integral um, is the area that lies beneath the hypsometric curve uh, and you can see it's shaded in grey and labelled um, in figure one um, and that represents the relative total uh, surface area above the base level of a drainage basin um, and it's a value uh, from zero to one that's unscaled uh, and theoretically the higher the hypsometric integral the less uh, erosion that is believed to have occurred in that region um, and we can calculate uh, this value using the equation at the bottom of the slide here. So how does uh, the glacial buzzsaw influence hypsometry? Um, so the glacial buzzsaw is an erosional mechanism um, in which the elevation of the equilibrium line altitude has a significant influence over the long-term hypsometry um, of the mountain range. Uh, Eckholm et al in 2009 uh, established that the majority of uh, global maximum elevations were generally no higher than 1,500 metres above their ELA, um, and the hypsometric maxima are typically uh, below that ELA. Um, and both of these indications 
um, or sorry, both of these are indications that glacial buzzsaw is, um, uh, is operational um, in that region. And we can see this relationship uh, nicely uh, in figure two, which is taken from the Agham paper. Um, and here the term hypsometric maxima refers to the elevation at which the highest frequency of proportional surface area resides. So cumulative hypsometric curves have been used as a method for inferring the stage of geomorphic evolution of a region. Um, and Omori in uh, 1993 applied the transitions um, in the cumulative hypsometric curve through the stages of uh, landscape evolution, according to Hack's scheme of uh, 1976. Um, and that's from the developing stage all the way to the declining stage. Um, and panels A and B show that um, as a valley is eroded, its cumulative hypsometric curve becomes progressively uh, concave uh, before it reaches a critical level of uh, concavity um, in which it cannot uh, become any further concave as uh, the basin has reached its base level. So the aims of this piece of work um, were to investigate the degree to which uh, hypsometric analyses of three glaciated mountain ranges in different stages of tectonic and geomorphic evolution and match the theoretical frameworks proposed by Strahler and Omori, and then looking at how erosion, uplift, and the position of the modern ELA control the hypsometric distributions in each case. And in order to meet these aims, um, we hypothesized a series of expectations for each study area, uh, which were based on the theoretical assumptions uh, of hypsometry and uh, geomorphic evolution, um, in which we expected there to be a clear difference in the mountain range hypsometry. Uh, hypsometric integrals and stage of geomorphic evolution for the three study areas um, in which each site was characterized as either having an erosion rate that is greater than the uplift rate or an erosion rate approximately equal to the uplift rate or an erosion rate that is less than the uplift rate. So after trawling through the literature three study areas were chosen based on their erosion rates uh, with respect to their uplift rates um, of which we did use the measured uh, rate from already uh, published work, which you'll see uh, cited on the following uh, couple of slides. And it's important to note that all three study areas were split into eight approximately equal sub areas to allow for hypsometric comparisons within each of the study areas. So the first study area is uh, the Iraqi Mount Cook Range, which is in the Midwest part of the South Island of New Zealand. Um, among the central section of the Southern Alps. And this is a region where erosion is greater than uplift um, with erosion rates between five and seven millimeters per year and uplift rates between one and 2.5 millimeters per year. And you can see the hillshed diagram uh, on the right shows the eight sub areas for the Iraqi Mount Cook range. Uh, the lower elevations are in green and the higher elevations are in red there. And the second uh, study area is the Kumbu range and uh, that is in the eastern section of the central greater Himalaya, which crosses the border of uh, Tibet and Nepal. Um, and this is a region where the erosion rate is approximately equal to the uplift rate. Um, and here there are erosion rates between 3.5 uh, and 5 millimeters per year, and uplift rates of uh, 4 to 5 millimeters per year. And again, the hillshade shows the eight uh, sub areas for the Kumbu range there. And finally, the third uh, study area is the Northwestern Alps, which is the northwestern uh, section of the European Alps, comprising sections of the French, Swiss, and Italian Alps. Um, and this region uh, is characterized as having an erosion rate less than the uplift rate, with erosion rates of around 0.9 millimeters per year and an uplift rate of 1.5 to 2.5 uh, millimeters per year. Um, and again, you can see the eight sub areas in the hillshade there. Um, and if you can see my cursor, uh, this is the uh, Rhone Valley here running between um, sub areas two and seven. So to calculate the regional glacial ELA, um, individual glacial ELAs were estimated uh, in each study area using the ArcGIS tool developed by Pelletero et al, uh, 2015. Um, and this automates the calculation of uh, glacial ELAs. Uh, the regional ELA was then calculated as the mean of the individual uh, glacier ELAs per study area. So this ELA estimation tool requires three inputs. 
The first is a DM of the glacier surface, such as the one shown in figure 10 on the screen. The second uh, input is a specified contour uh, interval, which we set as 50 meters, um, resulting in an ELA estimation error of plus or minus 25 meters. And the final input is an ELA estimation ratio method, uh, which is a value that approximately uh, predicts the net ma mass balance um, of a glacier. Uh, and here we use the accumulation area ratio and the area altitude balance ratio. So how did we quantify the hypsometry for each of the uh, study areas? Um, in a geographic information system, um, and asked a global uh, DEM, uh, which is around 30 me uh, meters per pixel um, of each study area, or sub area was classified into 100 meter elevation bins um, and the surface area in uh, kilometers squared uh, for each of those bins uh, was then extracted and used to construct the hypsometric curves. So for the non-cumulative curves, the non-cumulative proportional area was calculated using the first equation, which you can see on the screen there, uh, and that was uh, per elevation bin. Um, and for the cumulative curves, the non-cumulative proportional area was uh, accumulated and then to calculate the hypsometric integrals for each study area, um, we used Strahler's equation, uh, which you can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, and that is the same equation that um, I showed you earlier. So we also determined the influence of the regional ELA on the maximum elevations of the study areas uh, by measuring the maximum elevation threshold up to 1,500 metres above the ELA for each study area. Um, and that is similar to that of what Eklal Metal uh, 2009 um, had done in the figure that I showed you earlier. Um, and this uh, effectively refers to the uh, surface area that exists between the regional ELA and 1,500 metres above the ELA um, and comprises a maximum elevation threshold uh, region. So here are the regional ELA results. Um, and you can see um, that using the uh, AAR methods and the AABR methods um, and the comparisons with the uh, published uh, regional ELA estimations, um, we have the values that uh, we calculated that most closely match the published values are highlighted in red and those are the values that we used for subsequent analysis. Um, so for the Iraqi Mount Cook range, the ELA of 34 glaciers was estimated and using the AABR method, um, it gave us a regional ELA of 1,742 meters. For the Cumbu range, the ELA of 68 glaciers was estimated, and using the AABR method, it gave us a regional ELA of 5,553 metres. And for the Northwestern Alps, uh, the ELA of 61 glaciers was estimated, and using the AAR method this time, it gave us a regional ELA of 2,930 metres. So the figure on screen shows you the uh, hypsometry plotted non-cumulatively, uh, as well as the hypsometric integrals for the three study areas and their eight sub areas. Um, and the full site here, or the full study area, uh, is drawn as a black line in the uh, plot, and the eight sub areas are in uh, various colours. And the straight dashed red line is the regional ELA for each study area, and the straight dotted line is the median, uh, or sorry, the regional median uh, glacier elevation for each of the study areas. So the hypsometry of the Iraqi Mount Cook range has a, a high frequency of surface area around the mid-elevations, uh, which does also coincide with the regional uh, ELA and is then followed by a sharp decline uh, in surface area. Uh, the hypsometric integrals are generally less than um, or equal to 0 0.4, and the full study area has an integral of 0 0.34, which does meet our expectations. Um, for the Cumbu range, the hypsometry is somewhat bimodal, um, the highest frequency of surface area lies at around uh, at elevations around 400 metres lower than the regional ELA. Um, the proportion, proportion of surface area um, at and above the regional ELA for the Kungu range shows a little sign of rapid uh, decrease throughout all of the sub areas. Uh, the integrals for the Kungu range are between uh, 0 0.4 and 0 0.55, um, which does also meet our expectations. So for the Northwestern Alps, um, the non-cumulative hypsometric curves indicate that the hypsometry of this region is characterized by two distinct distributions comprised of sub-areas one to four and sub-areas five to eight. 
So sub areas five to eight are dominated by much uh, higher elevations shown by the hypsometric maxima um, and the higher uh, hypsometric integrals compared to uh, sub areas one to four. So, uh, so for sub areas one to four, the decline in surface area um, at and above the ELA uh, is gradual and begins at lower elevations than uh, that of sub areas five to eight. Um, and the differences between the two groups of sub areas here may be the result of uh, spatially variable erosion and or uplift. And here we can see the hypsometry for the study areas plotted cumulatively. Um, and I'll now discuss how we can use uh, these curves to infer the stage of geomorphic evolution of each study area. So the cumulative curves for the Araki Mount Cook range are noticeably concave, uh, which supports what we expected for this mountain range. Um, and the concave curves and the lower hypsometric integrals reflect the fact that erosion is greater than uplift in this region. Um, as the topography has been eroded down to a level that is representative of a declining stage of geomorphic evolution uh, that reflects an erosional steady state. Uh, for the Kumbu range, the curves are predominantly S-shaped, uh, which again does support what we expected for this mountain range. Um, and the Kumbu range has a relatively uh, higher uplift rate compared to the two study areas, uh, which may explain the high hypsometric integrals we found for this region. Um, indicating that uplift may have played a greater role um, than erosion in contributing to the hypsometry uh, of this region. Um, the cumulative curves and integrals uh, for the Cumbria range are indicative of uh, Amori's description um, of a culminating stage that represents a mountain range in a topographic uh, steady state. And finally, the cumulative curves for the Northwestern Alps um, are more concave than expected um, and appear to have a similar level of um, concavity to the cumulative curves for the Araki Mount Cook range. And this suggests that the hypsometry for these two mountain ranges um, are similar, despite the differences in the erosion and uplift rates in both regions. So this ultimately suggests that there are complications when using uh, cumulative hypsometric curves as a proxy um, for inferring the stage of geomorphic evolution of a region. Um, and as a result, the Northwestern Alps represents an early developing stage or declining stage of geomorphic evolution um, rather than a late developing stage, which is what we would have expected to see. So the figure on screen shows the maximum elevations associated with the uh, modern regional uh, ELA, um, which is drawn as a red line, and the maximum elevation limit 1,500 meters above the ELA, which is the uh, black dash line. Um, and the light grey region between the lines is the maximum elevation threshold above the ELA. So the results um, suggest that the Araki Mount Cook Range and the Northwestern Alps show evidence that uh, the glacial bus saw is active in at least six out of the eight sub areas um, and does limit topographic growth as the maximum elevations lie within um, the elevation threshold above the ELA. Um, and uh, despite the fact, however, that um, erosion uh, is less um, than uplift in the Northwestern Alps, uh, this may indicate that um, glacial erosion concentrated at higher elevations um, has dominated the, the, this landscape in the past, uh, most likely during the last glacial maximum, uh, which has led to a topographic constraint that has resulted in uh, the current hypsometric form of the Northwestern Alps. And then finally, for the Kumbu range, we see only one of the eight sub areas uh, lying within the maximum elevation threshold up to 1,500 meters above the ELA, uh, which suggests that either there's a lack of evidence um, uh, suggesting the glacial bus saw is operational in this region, um, or it could be that the topographic threshold limit is, is larger here. Um, and the topographic steady state um, of the Kumbu range may explain this in that neither uh, erosion or uplift are placing a considerable constraint on topographic growth or decline, um, resulting in the ineffective establishment of uh, glacial bus or denudation. So to summarise, we found that the hypsometry for the Iraqi Mount Cook Range and the Northwestern Alps is similar, uh, despite the differences in erosion and uplift in the regions, and both regions also show evidence that the glacial bus saw is active in uh, six out of eight of the sub-areas does limit uh, topographic growth. In the Northwestern Alps, uh, differences between the 
hypsometries of the sub areas uh, one to four and five to eight may indicate spatially variable uh, uplift or erosion. Uh, the hypsometry of the Kumbu range indicates that erosion can effectively maintain pace with uplift uh, whilst not placing a limit on the maximum elevations in that region. Um, and uplift is found to play a greater role than erosion in contributing to mountain range hypsometry, uh, particularly at the lower elevations and is substantiated by regions that uh, have uh, high uplift rates greater than around four millimeters PA, such as the Kumbu range, uh, which causes a differing erosional response. Uh, and finally, we suggest that there are complications um, that exist when using uh, cumulative hypsometric curves as a proxy for inferring the stage of geomorphic evolution for a region, as uh, we found that two regions characterized by differing rates um, of erosion and uplift display similar hypsometries uh, as shown by their cumulative hypsometric curves, uh, which does not support the theor theoretical expectations. So I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks and networking sessions taking place today. And I'd now like to invite you to ask any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Aaron. You're doing my job for me at the end. Um, can you hear me now, Aaron? Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you Hello. for your talk. Um, another thank great example of adding to data from previous papers and yeah. a great example of how much you can do without doing field work and what you can do um, from the UK yeah. looking at the rest of the world. Um, yeah. Um, so hopefully we've got a couple of questions for you. Um, first question I'd like to ask um, is did lithology come into any of your thinking about um, the hypsometry? And is, I guess, is that incorporated in, into the erosion and uplift rates? So in this case, no, it was definitely considered. Um, and unfortunately, due to the, the nature of the project being uh, part of my undergraduate dissertation work, I didn't have time. So it would have been nice to incorporate uh, geology or lithology into the um, into the research because as you can imagine it probably did play quite a great role in in the erosion of the areas um, and it would definitely have a, an effect on the hypsometries as well um, but again that would be something that would be nice to include in in future work maybe okay um yeah that's fine you you know you don't have a limited amount yeah. <laughs> you have a limited amount of time don't you doing these things it's always definitely. a lot of pressure <laughs> um another similar question um, are there any other similar indexes to hypsometry that you can could use alongside it to help you understand the geomorphic scale, stage of a landscape on these large scales? Um, I guess if yeah. you think about the two landscapes that turned out to have quite similar hypsometry. Yeah. What else um, could you use to pull them apart? So there, there are a couple of um, sort of hypsometric analysis methods that um, I did start to use um, in this project, but I didn't have time to, to present them in this, um, in this talk. Um, but, but using those hypsometric curves that I uh, presented to, you can um, assess the, the skewness and kurtosis of, of the uh, non-cumulative distributions. Um, and in doing that, you are effectively um, assessing the amount of um, headward erosion that might have occurred in that region. Um, and again, that's just a nice way to, to quantify um, such a broad scale uh, process like erosion in this case um, it's nice to quantify that into into a, a, a value that you can you can analyze far far more easily um, and conceptualize into to how that may play a role um, in, in influencing the hypsometry of the region great thank you um, I have a have another question um, so you are supervised by Professor Ed Rhodes, how did yeah. you get away with doing a dissertation that wasn't about luminescence dating? <laughs> um, <laughs> Quite well, an impressive feat. Discussions, uh, yeah, discussions did um, did crop up where luminescence may may have uh, come into the project, but um, yeah, I think um, with, with Ed, he was just very interested to to supervise a project that he'd, he'd never really um, been able to supervise before, so. Um, it was definitely nice to do the work with him and he was very excited about it. 
um, as well as Daryl. So uh, that definitely played into um, into enjoying the the project. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Um, another quick quick point that you could maybe expand yeah. on. Um, I maybe don't know how to ask this properly because it's definitely not my area of expertise, but yeah. could you talk any more about the relationship between ELAs and hypsometry? Does that make sense? Yeah, so um, it's, it's generally thought that the ELA, um, so whether that's in a basin or, or in a region, um, coincides with the uh, area, or sorry, the elevation at which the, the highest proportion um, or highest frequency um, of surface area exists in a region. And that's uh, mostly because um, glacial landforms, which um, are produced obviously by, by glacial erosion, um, you, you get processes like abrasion um, uh, and glacial excavation, um, removing such vast quantities of, uh, of surface area at the higher elevations above the ELA um, that you tend to see um, that the high proportion of surface area residing either at or just around 200 metres below the glacial ELA, which is the point at which um, erosion is believed to, to be maximum um, or at its highest, sorry. Um, and that's uh, going back to the, the paper that Eggholm uh, et al um, did in uh, 2009. Um, and that really provides a nice uh, summary um, of the relationship between ELA and hypsometry. So if, if you're interested, I'd definitely recommend reading that paper. Okay, great. Thanks so much for your really clear answers and for a great talk. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. There's lots of congratulations in the chat and encouragement to publish your work. It's obviously a very high standard. So yeah, yeah. congratulations again. Um